Good afternoon. Hola, como estan? It's cold out there. Muy bien, que bueno. Welcome once again to History 3000, Section 2. The French Revolution and Napoleon. We have a, a fair amount to accomplish today, given that I want to hand out the, <coughs> the prompt for paper number one, but also say something about that, that entire assignment. To begin, though, with names. Now, I know that a number cannot be here because of the, the weather and illness. Uh, I guess I should think of you as the ones with four-wheel drive. <laughs> but uh, uh, Edmund, I don't see. Um, and in general, I do appreciate it when a student is not here to hear from it, to hear from the student beforehand. So I have some, some way to keep track of that. Absolutely. See, Cameron, I don't see. Um, Brian is here. Hi, here's, here is Edmund. Brian, I see back there. Uh, let's see, John off campus. And um, you're now in the CU Net list. And John, I, I, I just put the paper prompt on Blackboard half an hour ago. But I have to say, I'm not sure that CU Net students have access to that, to that um, prompt. And I think what I will do is uh, make a note to send you uh, the prompt via email. So, so you will have it too. Uh, Erica is here. And uh, let's see, Dylan is here. Um, Dune, there we go. And uh, Andrea, there we go. And let's see, Danielle, I know, could not make it. Um, Rihanna is right here. And Fallon is here. And uh, Sydney, let's see, Sydney, I don't know. Okay, let's see. Um, Cassidy, I knew she wouldn't be here. That's right. Ryan is not here. Austin is here. And <clears throat> oh, Joe is here. And Jennifer, I knew, would not be here. Allison also, I knew, would not be here. Um, Lindsay Shelton. OK, Lindsay's here. Uh, Victor, um, Amy, um, let's see, Caitlin, don't see. Dennis Vega. Let's see, Robert Hopkins, I knew would not be here, and Isabella Dow. <coughs> Excuse me, I knew would not be here. Anyone whose name I did not call. I'm starting to get a pretty, pretty firm sense of who is in the class and who is no longer in the class. I think we are, we are 24, although today we are 14. <laughs> we are 24, and, um, and, I, and there is, of course, then also John in the, on the CUNET list. And as I say, John, I will, I will be in touch with you <coughs> about all of this. Okay. Questions you have at this point? Concerns you have? Logistics? Yes. Erica? Um, I'm a little bit confused on who the Girondins. OK. That's, they are named for a province in the, hi, how are you doing, Cameron? They are named for a province in the west of France. Um, that's a section of the Jacobins uh, around the political leader, around several political leaders, but the most famous is Jacques-Pierre Brissot. And I think we, we talked last time about how difficult it was to take these factions within the Jacobin party and say, on any given issue, well, who, who, is, who is in favor of which? The, the factions also divided along lines of personality. The Girondins are the factions behind Brissot and against Robespierre and what's called the mountains, or in French, the Montagnard. Okay? And so, so that's who the Girondins are. And are the Girondins also the mountains? No. The Girondins and the mountain are altogether uh, opposed to each other within the, the larger aegis of the Jacobin party. 
Brissot against Robespierre, Girondins against Mount, the mountain. Okay, so to, sometimes it can seem like less radical against more radical, but sometimes it cannot seem that way. For example, the Girondins was more, were, were more likely to favor a lesser sentence on Louis the Sixteenth than execution at the guillotine. The mountain stood for that execution. It's a fair question, and I think you've got Tackett, who spent his entire career trying to disentangle these issues, uh, and you can see how much he puts into it <laughs> to disentangle these issues, because on, on one page it'll look as though they're almost indistinguishable, and on another page they'll be at swords points. Um, so it's kind of like a political party left wing right wing kind of? Like well, they're all so yes, except when they're in perfect agreement about something and it seems as though it's a personal snag that has held them apart. Suppose they're both the left wing, but Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. I suppose. Right wing versus them. I suppose. Although, depending on the issue, it, it, it's not clear which one you would want to assign as Bernie Sanders and which one you would want to assign as Hillary Clinton. If you look at the issue of the war, Brissot the moderate on whether to execute the king or not is a huge advocate for war. So it becomes very difficult. Yeah, Did Lindsay. Did Jacobins spread out past France, like yes. into England? Oh, Scotted? oh. Uh, they, they certainly had sympathizers. Scotland? And remember that everywhere the French armies go, and we see only the beginning of this here. We will see more of this in later readings beyond 1794. Everywhere the French revolutionaries go, they have a certain degree of following in non-French areas, some of, some of which, some of those areas of which they annex to France. For example, <clears throat> um, for, for several years I lived in western Germany in what's, what's called the Rhineland, what's called the left bank of the Rhine. Your author misidentifies it at one point as the right bank. but It's the left bank, in other words, the, the west side of the Rhine River. And um, most of it, most of the places I lived were at one time or another France because Napoleon went on to annex them. In fact, revolutionary armies went on to annex them. And yes, everywhere there were Jacobins to, um, to stand with the French, whether it's Italy or, uh, or, or Germany, what became Belgium or um, the Netherlands, everywhere. Um, there were Jacobins, local Jacobins, who, who, you know, a minority, and no doubt for the most part in cities. But yes, there were Jacobins, people who believed, um, who, who believed in the message of, let's say, radical democracy. Yes. Each faction was out to outdo each other in their devotion to the revolution. Which yes. True to the revolution. Yes. Yes. And, and as this fear of conspiracy and this hysteria grew, they attacked one another in terms um, all but identical from the terms they had used to attack noblemen who had been against the revolution from the first. And you can say, well, by rational standards, that makes no sense. Erica, did I satisfy your answer as between oh, these yeah. groups? I, I Confused. There's so many. Right, right. And, and you don't have to know. I mean, I think you know. You should try to hold on to the name Maximilian Robespierre, because he really was the leader of the Mountain. In other words, that faction of the Jacobin Party or Jacobin Club that took power in 1793, 1794, and that is really the name that we associate, and rightly, more than any other name, with the Reign of Terror. And that's when the tendency in the revolution to deal with its enemies by way of violence became more extensive and um, really centered in the, in the institution of the revolutionary state. Robespierre, the head of the mountain. And Brissot, whom I mentioned a, uh, a moment ago as the head of the Girondins, Brissot also fell to the terror. We're going to see that. And I've got that set up in a way in discussion. Um, later in the hour that I think will interest you because we'll, ha we'll, we'll revisit the, the 
Is it the one description we have? In any case, it's a very remarkable description we have of Brissot on his way to the guillotine. So let's, let's, let's go on, let's go on. Um, well, today we wind up Tackett, right? We wind up Tackett. And it's less important that you hold every, every, every detail in mind, less important that you uh, get every revolutionary politician whom he mentions uh, under the proper heading of um, his or her faction in the revolution, more important that you get an gener a general idea of how it is that he explains the coming of the terror in 1793, 1794, and that we have a basis then to think back on this period at the beginning of the revolution and consider what it means for the history of France, for the history of the world, right? Because ever since 1789, the French Revolution looms large in any discussion of political change. I dare say larger even than the American Revolution, and why not? It has such an extraordinary array of positions. Slavery was abolished in 1794, for goodness sake. Slavery was not abolished in the course of the American Revolution, as is well known. And in, in the midst of these factions and these differences, whether they rest in ideology or in personality, there's an extraordinary um, opening in the French Revolution toward, toward violence. And that's why it captures the attention of the world ever since. Hard for me to imagine that Ho Chi Minh did not study the French Revolution, or Mao Zedong, or Zhou Enlai. Hard to imagine that Castro or the leaders of the revolution in Algeria in 1956. Hard to imagine that these figures were not well versed in the French Revolution because it, it established for them, um, if, if not a robe mat, a kind of sense of the, of the territory that you enter into when you enter into a revolution and hence the, the significance of our topic. Tackett establishes that there's a great deal of complexity about the cause, well, about the causes of the reign of terror. And that idea of the complexity of the causes, look how much, look how much I had to, how much verbiage I spended on a very direct question that Erica put to me at the beginning of the hour. You know, that's an example, I think, of the very complexity that Tackett tries to address uh, in this book. You know, well, they are ideologically opposed, but they're not really ideologically opposed. You know, it kind of depends on, on the situation and depends on the issue. Um, so we'll, we'll have plenty of occasion to think back about, um, about Tackett. I um, wanted to uh, read to you a statement that he makes really at the very end of the book. And I think that will put some of the significance put his argument into a sharp focus here. The revolution, however, was not a linear process. The regime of the terror emerged in fits and starts. Through the interplay of individuals, factions, and events. What page are you on? Oh, I'm sorry, bottom of 347. Sorry, sorry, I didn't say that. Mm. Just a couple of sentences there, because it sums up, I think, the perspective the argument of this book. The revolution, however, was not a linear process. The regime of the terror emerged in fits and starts through the interplay of individuals, factions, and events in which fears fed by the fortunes of war and counter-revolution um, by reasoned reflection and complex emotions all played a part. In other words, numerous elements, numerous kinds of element that work into the analysis in question, as I think by now you know. In fact, when I have characterized Tackett's work as establishing that there were um, phases, distinct phases in the revolution as regards the final, um, the, the final establishment of the reign of terror, I've also called them aspects. And I've always stumbled a little bit on the word phases because I recognize <coughs> that in a sense it simplifies too much to say that there were distinct phases toward 1793, 1794, um, because while certainly violence, the reign of terror, was the outcome of this um, line of events 
over the first five years of the revolution, the line of events was far from straight. Indeed, it's not so that one segment constitutes a specific phase and the next segment a specific phase, that phase followed phase followed phase followed phase until the convention and the reign of terror. Because there were fits and starts and there were moments when in 1792 or 1793 it could seem as though those who were pushing ahead toward violence and ever greater violence um, reverted back to an attitude that would have been more suitable in 1789 or 1790 to a time of less severity in the revolution. And yet then they are again in the leadership calling for, for, for greater violence towards supposed enemies or some enemy of the revolution. So it's, it's more difficult. You can't even really say that you're looking at phases as though you were a botanist describing the phases by which, uh, by which a plant grows. grows. Yes, Brian. And then Joe. I think there's a point at which the war was unstoppable. Like when the king first said he wants to conjure, if the when the lower the third uh, people had called, if the nobles and the priests had joined them and given them what they want, would it have stopped the war? Is there a certain point it would have stopped the war? Is there a certain point where it had gone too far no matter what people Now when you say the war, you mean the civil war or the war with Prussia and Austria? The civil war, the the terror. Do you think there's a certain point that it got so far that even if the nobles had given in, even if the clergy had given in, there's people in the outlying areas would have said, no, we want more, we want more. They already felt that feeling. Or if the nobles and the clergy had given in and said, I think it would have been very hard across a wide line of conflicts for conflicts to be halted. I stop at the term unstoppable. I would stop at the term inevitable because that, that suggests um, that after a certain point there was some predetermination of outcome. And I, and I do not think, and I think Tackett gives evidence that when we, when we analyze a specific point in the development of the revolution, um, we see options and we see men who choose, men who decide every step of the way. Having said that, I certainly echo what you say about the seriousness of the conflict. Once you have peasants who say, we don't need to compensate you for the dues that we no longer are obliged to render to you, and the Lord says, yes, you do need to compensate me for those dues, well, there's a, there, there's a hard and fast conflict there. And, it, and it's hard to see your way around it, uh, particularly at a time when law and order had broken down. That's this crisis of legitimacy that your author keeps mentioning that, that it took some time for the revolutionary state to be a state because it, because it did not have you know, courts and police and so forth at work out in France. So very hard to imagine these, the, the abatement of these conflicts, but I, I suppose some slender bit of possibility. Yeah. Other questions, other comments? Yeah. Oh, Joe, sorry. How many of the leaders in, like Robespierre and so were national level statesmen before this started? None. Not a one. This is the butcher, the baker, the candles. No, I exaggerate. But um, I mean, Robespierre was a provincial lawyer. Many of them had been lawyers. Many of them had been in the lower reaches of government. Well, you could say the, the, the handful of noblemen who were with the revolution from the first hour. I mean, a handful, Mirabeau, uh, Lafayette, people of that type. Yes, and they played, um, they, they played an influential role in 1789, though I think we saw that that role um, will have diminished by 1791, 1792. In fact, that when the revolutionaries screamed, betrayal, 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 they meant the very nobleman whose name whose names I just gave. Like Robespierre, if he wasn't used to dealing with the pressures of being a national legislator, and everybody that opposed him was a deceitful traitor who needed to be executed, that's, that's small-minded. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, he was not, he did not have the personality profile, perhaps the intellectual profile, but not the personality profile um, that one would seek in a leader for the most part. Um, that plays a, a, a role in this, Brissot too. I mean, I mean um, in, in terms of the way he handled himself in politics, you can say Brissot also was um, 
was a man of, of, of intolerance, of, of, of immense personal sensitivity, uh, rancor. I mean, th these are people who were not cut out. I mean, we could say, well, you know, that's the situation. They brought a monarchy down. There was no way for alternate leadership to develop itself under an absolute monarchy. The revolutionaries were bound to be just who they were, or that type anyway, yes. But you have two or three colleagues who have the same revolutionary dialogue that you have, and you watch them execute it, that paranoia will spread to you, okay? Mm -hmm. That same paranoia of when are they coming for me next right. time? I mean, you could, you could view that as a 25-word summation of why Robespierre himself was led to the guillotine in 1794, an uprising of French people who were tired of the inhumanity, in part, in large part, though, just other Jacobins who were up to their neck in the same responsibility that he was and thought that he would turn against them next. Chilling view, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my point being, though, that there wasn't a sort of a national level vision <clears throat> of where they were headed. They, they started by tearing down what used to be without having a direction to go which left them in a cesspool. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, they, they're the first. I mean, they're the first of this kind. I mean, there were certainly the Americans, and they, they certainly borrowed from the Americans the, the basic design of a constitution. Lafayette would have been a good one to carry it from there. Well, he was active. He was head of the National Guard, but the revolution um, by 1791 um, just, you know, it, it just exceeded him in radicalism, and that's why by 1792, to his shock, he had lost control even over the National Guard and left to join up with the enemy. So, yeah, I mean, look, you can look at the great revolutionaries. You can look at Castro and Lenin and Trotsky and Mao Zedong and so on and so forth, and you can say, well, no, they did not learn the trade of government in government. But they learned, uh, they, they certainly prepared themselves as though they were a shadow government. So that the seizure of power was something for which they had worked for years and years and years. And, and had at least some, some conception, however remote from reality, of what they would do in that magic hour. Not so any of these. They were groping ahead. I mean, they, they, they launched into a revolution that presented them with situations that they had not foreseen at every turn of events, and they reacted the way they did. And had they, had they been in any way prepared for this? No. No, they had not been in any way prepared for this. Quite a spectacle, isn't it? Quite a spectacle. Um, I'm sure the counter argument is if you wait for if you wait under an auto, an automatic monarchy for people to be prepared to 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 um, govern in its place, you wait forever, right? That's really waiting for Godot. And Godot never appears because these are these are people who are always going to be in the lower reaches of uh, of authority if they have any authority at all. And how should they learn how to govern down there? I want to point out to you that to some extent, when you analyze an event like the French Revolution, you analyze it in terms of structure. You say, well, I, I, can, see, I can identify a, a, a structural opposition between, let us say, the Catholic faith and revolutionary consciousness. That those two were bound to be in some kind of conflict. They were bound to um, cause a collision. And um, the question is, what will then play out of that collision? You can look at the, this issue of the peasantry that we raised a moment ago. The peasant who says, I need to compensate no one for my liberation from what were called feudal dues. And the Lord, who had been the recipient of those feudal dues, who said, yes, you do. Yes, you do need to compensate me. You can say that's a structural opposition, bound to work out one way or another. This 
conflict in the revolutionary leadership between those who centered upon around Brissot and those who centered around Robespierre, the Girondins and the Mountain. You can say, well, a structural conflict bound to play out one way or another, and so on, and so on. But this is a book that also, I think you will agree, tries to identify the individual in the midst of all this. To some degree, the revolutionary leaders become individuals. Brissot comes off as an individual. Robespierre comes off as an individual. Louis XVI comes off as an individual. Lafayette, uh, Mirabeau, and so forth, the big names of the revolution. But to some extent, this book tries to identify people you have never heard of who, by virtue of their literacy, in a country that was for the most part illiterate, and by virtue of the fact that some of what they wrote has been preserved, give us a sense, a clear sense, of the response of at least that person to the revolution as it, um, as it unfolded. And to a large degree, Tackett is for, you know, in the midst of, you know, yes? See, what I really wanted to hear was the Western country people version. The ones who supported the, 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 the At the Vendee? Yeah, the ones who basically led the revolution and the counter-revolution. The counter-revolution? Yeah. Well, you'll get a lot more of them from Peter McPhee, who is book number three on the list, because he is focused upon the um, upon the peasantry, and they, of course, in their region, uh, ha had immense importance. Um, they stood for the church. They thought that, well, I mean, a peasant has a vested interest in uh, in the, the the adjustment of land ownership, land control, and to the extent that I think we idealize the peasantry if we say that. They were <clears throat> anxious to restore to the church the land that they had perhaps bought at auction block in, uh, in, in 1789 or 1790. But this whole effort by the revolution to interfere with, if you will, the spirituality of the church, the spiritual mission of the church, um, the, the priesthood, to impose a, a vow of loyalty to the state alongside the vow of loyalty uh, to the church and its doctrine and its teachings. That sat, th depending upon the region, and depending to, to some extent upon leadership supplied by local nobility, that sat bad with the peasantry, and in particular in Western France. In what particular. What's just amazing is the parallelity of today. The more rural areas are more conservative or moderate, the urban areas seem more liberal. More right, although there certainly are peasant areas where the revolution had support. And all your authors try to draw home the point that th th the revolution caught everybody up in its toe, um, it, whether they developed misgivings or even opposition of the kind we're talking about here uh, or not. That is, all of these municipalities that held elections for municipal government all of these people who benefited from the new institution of the justice of the peace, instead of having to wait on seniori a seniorial court that might take you know, years for a common grievance to be, to, to be heard and decided upon. Um, there were certainly peasants who went uh, to fight, uh, in, in the, volunteered to fight in, uh, in revolutionary armies. Um, a study of, um, let's say, revolutionary celebrations uh, you know, the, the Bastille Day um, in, in the countryside show that there were festi uh, festivities held there too. Uh, there were certainly a, a few regions where, um, where, where faces became set against the revolution. That's correct. But for the most part, it's a complex picture. Imagine the peasant who says, I'll never compensate anyone for my, for my land. I'll never pay a tithe again, the way that was extracted from me by the Catholic Church. But I'll fight the revolution to the death on this question of the civil constitution of the clergy. A priest owes his allegiance to Rome, not to Paris. And you can well imagine that. 
as an emotion that tore at the hearts of millions of peasants. Complex picture. Complex picture. Yeah. The, a certain militancy was necessary. The entire gestation of the revolution occurred in the framework of this war with yeah. the rest of Europe. Yeah. The militancy that you, when you hear the yeah. first let, you go, wow. Most yeah. militant song you're ever going to hear. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, once, once war was declared, once war broke out in 1792, uh, the French government, the, the um, um, what was it, the Legislative Assembly, had to respond in some manner or another. That is true. That is true. Of course, one could say that the French had done everything up to that point to, um, to provoke Austria and Prussia into an invasion. But of course, the, as, as, you know, to think your, back, your way back into, in the 1790s and follow an argument back and forth about this issue, you could say, well, Louis XVI had done everything to provoke them in the first place. So, go ahead and declare war on Spain and Britain while we're at it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, when, and once these declarations fell, uh, the French, in some way, had to make good on it, or else they just, you know, suppose they gave they gave a war and nobody came. That would not be the the spirit in which they considered war. Yes. I think the monarchs of, for instance, the Habsburgs had sort of a vested interest in sealing off revolution. Yes, I do. I do. I mean, I can imagine. Um, I mean, there was a certain amount of satisfaction that an old rival had trouble, domestic trouble that would weaken it. I mean, that has to be seen also in the way that England or Austria or that is the Habsburg Empire, um, uh, Prussia and so forth viewed the French Revolution. A little bit of um, what the Germans call schadenfreude, means malice, enjoyment of the suffering of others, right? A little bit of that. Um, and, and of course, they could turn it to advantage, whether they thought on the continent Austria, Prussia, or whether they thought about the high seas and overseas, Great Britain. They could turn that to advantage. But the, 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 the French um, clearly, um, within the first year or two, um, <coughs> well, it's hard to say. When did the French actually appear to be going beyond the establishment of a constitutional monarchy that would have the inevitable effect of weakening the absolute, you know, monarchy in, in France. When when did that become clear? When the king tried to run away. Well, and, and, and but then they brought him back. And all of these characters that we've been talking about, whether um, Brissot and uh, I mean Brissot had a moment when he called for a republic after the king had escaped and been captured and brought back. But by the time the constitution was issued, September of 1791, all of them. You know, the, the masters of the guillotine, so to speak, were all behind the constitutional monarchy. I suppose the seizure of the king and his forceful, re, for, forceful return to Paris was a key event in the assessment of the revolution by other powers. But might have been inclined at the beginning to say, it's France's problem, not ours but who, who, who thought that there was a severity about this revolution and the treatment of the king that they could not, could not abide. And then, of course, things, as Tackett demonstrates, spiraled down in France over 1792, in particular with regard to the, um, the view of the monarch secret correspondence was published and that sort of thing until, well, until Louis was seized by an angry mob 10th of August 1792. And that was just a disaster. Yes? Um, had the weather and the harvest mm -hmm. not been such an issue, because I, I feel like those two things really play the huge yeah. role in this revolution. Those two things related to each other. Right. Would it had 
I mean, we can what if all day. Yeah, I we guess, can what if all day, but it's um, fun though. So. <laughs> the <laughs> bread and butter of history. <laughs> those two things put together is really what gave these men an opportunity. Well, you're certainly right. You could say the National yeah. Assembly um, was at the mercy of the king when it first proclaimed itself. The king had an army. It did not. There was no basis to, to, to suppose that this National Assembly would find any support of any kind. But hungry people gave them support in the city of Paris. And that's what changed the temperature of the whole thing. And those people were hungry because of bad harvests based upon weather. You can say that. You, that is, you can imagine that. You can string out a counterfactual. And then they started to have small wins, and then it seems like it just kind of snowballed. Yeah. Yeah, it did. But, you know, I mean, angry people have suddenly been, um, it's, it's as though the revolution has beckoned forth their anger, and look at all they pull off. I mean, by, by October of that same year, 1789, we're only, what, what would that be? Five months into the revolution, women from Paris have marched all the way out to the, you know, the 20 kilometers or so to the court at Versailles and seized the king, the queen, and the Dauphin to return, the, the heir to the throne, to return to Paris so they can be under better supervision and not conspire against the revolution. Uh, I mean, there's, a, there's an important landmark in the revolution. Yes? Um, question. So the war with Prussia, were they just afraid that the attitude of revolution was there? They became afraid of that. So that was the Yes, they became afraid of that. I mean, at, at first the revolutionaries were quick to uh, issue proclamations. This is the dawn of a new age for all of humanity. Uh, and your author offers quotes to that effect. The, the, um, uh, all the world will, will, will view us and, and take an example from us. And that began to look as though it had a kind of um, missionary fervor to it that uh, alarmed monarchs in uh, Berlin and uh, Vienna, yes. Some of that was also the revolutionaries saying, this is really France and we're going to liberate that too. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, there are examples of that. In the south of France, for example, there was land that had been contested between the French and the papacy and it was annexed in 1791. Yes? So, um, Pre-revolution desire Pardon me? Pre-revolution, the dire situation. Yeah. Moving forward, how were they able to fund this? Well, um, they were, of course, I mean, their, their, their currency was in free fall. They decided that they needed a new currency. And um, several months into the revolution, seized lands, in particular from the church, sold them at auction block, and used the proceeds as the basis for a new currency that they called the assignat. And yes, the assignat was under recurrent inflation throughout this entire period, um, because whether we're looking at 1792 or 20 years ahead to <coughs> Napoleon at war, it, it takes a great deal of financial strength to launch armies of the sides that the revolution and then the empire would need. Um, it was not secure, but as history shows, it turned out to be secure enough. And of course, when they went into um, other countries, whether they annexed them or set up some kind of puppet state, there was plunder. There was plunder to the, <coughs> advantage, of, uh, to the advantage of France. Okay, you know, I want to uh, get back to this idea that in the midst of all of this, there are individuals, real live people, not, you know, um, larger than life folks, but real life people 
like, um, like you and I are, right? And we, and, and we respond to the situation in which we find ourselves and ordinary people in France respond to the situations in which they found themselves. And I draw your attention, um, and this is going to be a, a, a focus um, for, for, for today, not only in a discussion I'd like to hold, but also, uh, as you can see in several minutes, for the paper that I will ask you to write. Um, turn to pages 9 and 10. We get a kind of cast of characters, all right? Top of page 9, invariably, excuse me, invariably our list of witnesses is especially rich for the city of Paris, four Parisian correspondents with letters dating from the late old regime through the revolution will appear, blah, 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 blah. Adrien Joseph Colson, not a famous name, just a man who happened to be in Paris and who wrote letters that have been, well, preserved. The principal estate agent for a noble family living in the city wrote two or three letters a week to a friend and business associate in the province of Berry in central France. From his upstairs apartment not far from the city hall, he provided a running commentary on the events and perspectives of the right bank neighborhood. Just across the Seine, that's the main river through Paris, the minor publisher and bookseller Nicolas Rouault uh, penned regular missives to his brother, a parish priest in Normandy. A great admirer of Voltaire, whose works he helped edit, Rouault self-consciously identified with the Enlightenment and he provided lengthy <coughs> analyses of developments in his radical left bank publishing district. Rosalie Julien, wife of a future member of the National Convention, <coughs> divided her, um, in other words, a future radical, right? National Convention. Divided her residence between Paris, not far from O's ho home, and her husband's family residence in the southeastern province of Dauphiné. <coughs> Well-educated and highly literate, she pursued an intense correspondence with her husband and her older son, both <coughs> named Marc Antoine, whenever the family was separated. Gilbert Rome, a mathematics teacher and an amateur scientist, maintained a lifelong correspondence with his childhood uh, friend Gilbert Dubreuil in Auvergne. After seven years as a private tutor in St. Petersburg, Rome returned to Paris in 1786, where he soon entered politics and served until his suicide in prison in 1795. Now, those are kind of the main figures of this effort to pinpoint the individual in the midst of tumultuous revolutionary events. But there are a bunch more. In fact, um, as you go down uh, the bottom of page 9 and then on to page 10, you get more. It's just uh, the four that I, that I named are the, most, are the most prominent. And I'd like to take up the issue with you of, just for a moment, how it is that we know anything about what it is that these pe people thought in other words, how we gain access to, in the case of Colson, the, the letters that he wrote. If you um, move from page 9, where he is introduced, to page uh, 421. And now this is at the end. This is nothing you read. This is under the general heading of Sources and Bibliography, which is the heading that appears on page 419. And... Um, the, the, the heading, um, Correspondence, Diaries, and Memoirs, and then the subheading, I guess sub-subheading, Collections. The next sub-subheading is Individuals. And I find the name Colson on page 421. Here he is, Adrien Joseph Colson, Correspondence. Okay. And then, then you get some, now I'll, I'll point out to you that your author has used two sources for Colson. Uh, no doubt they overlap quite a bit. Beyond the semicolon, I see excerpts in Lettre d'un bourgeois de Paris à un ami de Provence, and then the years, edited by Chantal Plantier Sanson, Paris 1993. In other words, some archivist or historian has done all of us the service <coughs> of putting out excerpts of his letters in French in Paris in 1993. And Tackett, who is nothing if not an assiduous researcher, 
has gotten hold of those, and those help him to form an idea or to find out what Colson wrote. But before the semicolon, there's AD Andre, and then what, it, what is evidently a kind of call number. Anyone have any idea what AD is? I know Dominic, no. What is AD in this context? Anyone know? If you go to the front of this entire section, this entire apparatus of notes and bibliography at the end, I come on page, what is it, 351, right? Yeah, 351 to the heading abbreviations. And AD, I found, find Archive Departemental du Departmental Archives of, and since he's from Berry, I would say Berry. So in other words, your historian has gone to, in that part of France, the equivalent of, let's say, the Pioneers Museum, and found Cosson in its list of items, archival material, and ordered it. And it's been brought to him, and he has perused it for the evidence that he wants. And that's why he can quote Colson 15 or 20 or 25 times over the course of the book, because he has done this. And I don't know exactly how it works. I know in Germany, the little folders tend to be a kind of uh, heavy blue paper tied in knots that are often difficult to untie to the great amusement of archivists, because they have then helped you untie them. How they look in France, I cannot say. But that's the deal. And if you've ever gone to an archive or a museum here because you wanted to find out about your great grandparent or whatever, and I don't know what they have exactly, in how they dole out their material exactly in, at the Pioneers Museum here. We have um, Professor uh, um, Davis Witherow uh, on the faculty here who is also the curator there, and I bet she could tell anyone. But that's the basic idea that in a museum or in an archive, records that someone at some point has determined were important to keep have been kept, and the later historian has access. What is kept and what is not kept is a huge discussion for historians and certainly involves politics, but that's not our concern here. Our concern is how do you find anything about Colson, the witness in question. Okay, I'd like to look though at Rosalie Julien. She's um, it listed there too. You see her down there about midway through the paragraph on page nine, wife of a future member of the National Convention, and so on. A woman. And so we, in a small way, can redress the immense imbalance that has affected us so far in this course, and that is the imbalance of gender. Because most of what we take up concerns men. Most of the perspectives we absorb are perspectives from the men who took part in the revolution, in this case, the leaders of the revolution. Women were banned from the assembly, that is, from membership in the assemblies. Women uh, could not be a, a, a deputy in the convention. Therefore, the, the leadership was exclusively male leadership. Hard to say, well, not hard to say what a woman thought, but certainly impossible to find a woman's role in the, uh, in the determination of, of, of policy. But here we have Rosalie Julien. So let us indulge ourselves for the next several minutes and see what it is exactly that she had to say. Page 455. <clears throat> I turn with you now to the index. Julien, bottom of page 455. There begins there, it stretches <coughs> onto page 456, a long list of page numbers in the index that refer back to points in the narrative where Tackett has quoted or cited her. All right? So we get, I don't know, 30, 35 references to her. She's a very active correspondent, and that's how we know anything about her response. But we know so few responses of this type that what we have from her is good as gold. She cannot speak for every individual or every woman or every woman who lived in Paris or every woman of a certain class who lived in Paris or anything of the kind. 
but she gives us what we don't have if we didn't have her. And that is a rather extensive correspondence from which we can know what one person thought, even if the rest of it, um, other people, have to remain um, a bit vague. Um, from there, I, I, I perform with you a small trick of the trade that I usually perform. I go to a point where she has been quoted, and this is on page 31, just at the middle of the page, critical comments about the nobility are ascribed to her. Now this is at the very beginning, right? Many, many people who were not members of the nobility made critical comments about the nobility for reasons that you and I know. They had all these privileges. Why should they have all these privileges? I mean, opinion about this kind of thing was just beginning to be mobilized. And I notice as I look down that it seems that the, uh, the next footnote, I detect at least, is number 49. So I look ahead to the notes to page 357. And I find there, top of the page, notes to pages 26 to 31. I look to the bottom. I, found, I find the note to page 49 on Julien Sicoit's Bondance, especially letters of, of September 29th and October 30th, 1785. All right? So this is really before the revolution. This is, this is three and a half years before the revolution. And she says something a little bit diminishing about the nobility. Okay? Now, I want to know, before I checked, what this correspondence is. And um, I go back close to where we looked for Colson a moment ago, to page 423, same section, right? Remember, it was sources and bibliography, um, subsection, correspondence, diaries, and memoirs sub-subsection individuals. Um, and on page 423, two pages beyond Colson, the reference to Colson, I find, there she is, Rolea Jusin, correspondence, A-N-A-P, 23-A-P. And those are evidently abbreviations that we can find in our list of abbreviations. I refer to you once again, page 351, abbreviations. And under AN, I get Archive National, so National Archives. He found those in Paris. And what was the other? AP, uh, Parliamentary Archives of 1787 to um, 1860, uh, compiled, uh, uh, um, record, complete record of the debates, legislative debates, and political and legislative debates of the uh, French chambers. First series, 1787 to 1789. Okay? And this was edited by someone named Jérôme Mavidal and Émile Lorrain. 82 volumes. There's something for you to read between 1867 and 1913, because the French have wanted to compile their history. And as you can see, there have been these compilations of documents, whether private letters or... And in, in any case, that's where material, letters, from Rosalie Julien have been found. Moreover, I happened to be looking on in the bibliography, and you can think, yeah, I bet Sackett's the type to linger through the bibliography of a book. Right? It's, it goes with the territory. It goes with the occupation. And my eye fell upon something. Page 441, bottom of the page, Lindsay A. H. Parker, Writing the Revolution, A French Woman's History and Letters. So someone has written a book about, um, and I, I remember from one of the pri previous notes, that this work was cited with regard to Rosalie Julie. Someone has written a book about her that is centered upon these letters. So that's how we have the letters, that these various efforts have been undertaken by archivists or historians to keep alive the word of Rosalie Julien. 
Robespierre we know about. People, collect, people began to collect that if they did not burn them from you know, the, the, the time of his death. He was also, of course, at the center of various debates in the convention. His public utterance is well known. Yes, Brian. Speaking of the women and stuff, right in here where it dealt with the king, what they did to the king, what happened to his wife and kids? It didn't say when they killed them. They killed Marie Antoinette sometime thereafter, and the boy died. He died in prison. He was to, yeah, not long after. You didn't cover that. that. They may well not have covered that in there. The boy died after 1794. It may have been 1795. It's just a passing mention that Marie Antoinette had been executed. Yeah, and I don't, re I don't have a date for that. She was not executed at the same time as the king. The queen was executed as well. You see, the boy was, from the standpoint of monarchy, Louis the Seventeenth, which is why, in the Restoration, after Napoleon, the Bourbon monarch who came to power was called Louis the Eighteenth. The idea being that that th this constituted. Um, not a rupture, but an illegitimate violation of monarchical uh, um, uh, sequence. Okay, so, let's, so, let's, so let's, let's get into this a little bit. Now, when I read you something, I want you to tell me what you, what you see in the something that I read. I'm, and I've just jotted down more or less at random a series of pages where Rosalie Julienne is the topic, okay? And I would like you to tell me, well, what's the situation here? You know, just in general, you don't have to be specific. What's she responding to? And, and, and then tell me something about what you see in, in her. As I so told you on page 31, there was really next to nothing. She said something negative about the nobility along with everybody else. Okay, here, here's the bottom of page 31. The, the, the topic sentence of the paragraph reads, none of our letter writers seems to have been exceptionally pious. Several, several of them continued to maintain ties with religion. Rosalie Julien is known to have read the Gospels with her husband, Marc Antoine, a future Jacobin supporter of the terror. All right? Now, how do we know she read the Gospels with her husband? Yes, she wrote about it in a letter. That's what, that's what, that's what footnote, if you, if you doubt it, fly to Paris. Get the thing to hand. Read it. Translate it. Get somebody to translate it for you. If you don't speak French, where's, where's uh, Allison? She's our French speaker. Um, she's, she has car trouble today. but um, Read the thing and see if Tackett isn't correct that that's what she said. All right? Um, kind of remarkable, though, isn't it? I mean, remarkable in general to track down the religious ties before the revolution of people who later would um, carry out an assault to one degree or another on religion once the revolution was underway. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. Um, I mean, that's a subject of its own, but let's go on. Let's go on with our Rosalie Julienne. You get the logic of this thing. The next... Um, passage that I pulled out again, more or less at random, is on page 64. All right? Well, I guess it's one on 64 and one on 65. Yeah, that's what I have. Okay. Um, now, this is still 1789. The National Assembly has just been formed. And here we have Rosalie Julien. This is about the middle of the page. In late August, Rosalie Julien poured out her anxiety to her husband, who was away on business in southern France. <coughs> All right, so this is a, is a bourgeois family, right? Um, they're literate. Uh, he's away on business. Uh, they have no idea that in four years he'll be a member of the uh, National Convention. This is what she says to him. We are pushed about by so many currents, we are agitated by such diverse passions that it is like whirlwinds rushing and colliding in a violent storm. End of quote. Okay, so August. I mean, I get the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. 
has been issued. The assembly is in place. Um, uh, by the end of the month, well, wait a second. The, de the declaration is at the, at the end of the month. By at the beginning of August, there's the um, the elimination of feudal dues and other forms of privilege. Okay. And, and here she doesn't. She's not specific, but she speaks about atmosphere. What do you get from her about atmosphere? What does she seem like to you as you read this? Pardon? Maybe confusing for, for people to try to understand all the different sides and right. pamphlets that are going about and right, what right. stance do they take, who do they follow. Okay, okay. So there's a lot of confusion. I mean, she, re she registers that. And we know that in the context, um, you mentioned the pamphlets, you know, the extraordinary profusion of pamphlets that confuse people. What should we do? What should we do? Where's this revolution headed? Yeah, Cameron. Um, I wanted to say that even though she was a radical a few years later, she still wasn't, um, you know, proclaiming her voice or, you know, the college saying, you know, there will be this and that. Yeah. Sort of She's not exactly celebrating. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When she should be a radical woman. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things we register with her is a movement to a radical position that in August of 1789 she has not yet assumed. By the way, pull that, uh, that's a good comment. It'd be nice to get that broadcast out. That's the, the microphone for you, right there, Cameron. If you would pull that over, I'd appreciate that, right? We want the good con uh, comments to be broadcast yeah. out, right? <laughs> <laughs> the other ones don't matter as much. <laughs> hey, that's good. Um, yeah. And of course, she's, she's right in the vein where Tackett wants to find her because she's, she's reflecting on what he says. And that is that the revolution evoked strong passion, strong feeling, strong emotion. And that that has to be taken into account when we understand why people did what they did. I mean, look at the way she puts it again pushed about by so many currents, agitated by such diverse passions, that it is like whirlwinds rushing and colliding in a violent storm. All right? If you've ever read the great novel of the French Revolution, at least in the English language, by Charles Dickens called A Tale of Two Cities, I mean, he's forever using uh, a violent sea, a violent storm, <coughs> as a metaphor for the, you know, the, the the simple atmosphere that the revolution established in 1789 and there, thereafter. Let's look to the next page. Where is she here? Where is she here? Okay. A, a simple comment. Uh, five lines from the top, fears of grain shortages. This is uh, right where you were several minutes ago, Lindsay. Um, Cosson, Rouault, Julien, and many of the National Assembly deputies in Versailles all commented on the difficulties of finding bread. We can explain the taking of the Bastille on July, 7, July 14, 1789 as a response in part to hunger on the part of ordinary people, but, but here are people who are much better off than they are, and they too have trouble finding bread. And Rosalie Julien is one who has given testimony of that. So the issue of hunger, scarcity, evidently that reached quite a ways up the, up the hierarchy. Let's look on, page 68, page 68. Um, these are the October days. Now this is when the women of Paris, ordinary women, have trekked out to the castle at Versailles uh, there's been some bloodshed, they've killed some guards, and they've taken a hold of the king, the queen, and the dauphin, that is the king's son, um, in a manner of speaking, the future Louis the Seventeenth, and they have taken them back into Paris to put them better under popular control, revolutionary control. End of the paragraph. Ro Rosalie Julien. Rosalie Julien found the episode enormously upsetting. I am overwhelmed with sadness, she wrote to her husband, and remain at home without personal fears, but only with prayers to heaven for the stability of the state. 
Kind of a remarkable comment, wouldn't you say? What would you say, Amy, about this comment? It's fascinating. It kind of goes along with what Cameron was just saying, that you would think that as a woman she would be applauding these women who are you know, right. going, being this radical when she does eventually become this radical. But she clearly is more upset by right. everything that's being overturned and the, the normalcy of life is being completely turned up, upside down. Okay. So that's interesting. I mean, she... You know, I mean, the Jacobin Club may exist in October of 1789, but it has hardly established the, ra the radical profile, and she's, you know, a long way away from thinking of herself as a Jacobin. Um, she, she, she's full of passion, and, um, you know, as, as, as Cameron points out now, Amy, um, we're a long way from the kind of um, spirit of support for the, for the revolutionary people that she will express later during the revolution. I mean, she's, she's off put by the fact that ordinary people have taken events into their own hands and have gone out to Versailles and pulled the royal family back into Paris. There's a sense of shock about this. I mean, she's, I mean, if, I, if I'm trying to characterize her as a person, I think she's a person who's very alert to emotion, to feeling. I mean, so far, the quotations that we have looked into express strong feeling. And, of course, Tackett would jot, jot those down in his notes, <coughs> or he would uh, type them into his laptop. You can see that I'm an older uh, variant <laughs> researcher. Um, and he would... Uh, because they established so well this idea of emotional turmoil, emotional t tumult in the revolution. But people just are, are, are on edge a lot of the time. They don't know what's coming next. Okay, let's look on. Page 123, jumping ahead. Now this is the, hold on, be between hope and fear. Yeah, okay. Let's see, now where is she? Okay, this is... Um, that last paragraph in the section. Um, this is late 1791. So, all right, the National Assembly has come and gone. The Constitution has been issued. All of the excitement around Louis and his escape and his capture and his restoration to Paris, the Constitutional, all of that has, has, has taken place. And here you go. A few months later, Rosalie Julien recounted a dream. This is good. I've asked Sigmund Freud to be here today. <laughs> a dream, mind you, in which she was walking in the pale moonlight within a strange landscape when she too fell into a deep abyss. What's an abyss? What is that? Okay, there we go. The murky depths of some of something. We've got a we've got a, a, a literary uh, figure here in class with us. The, depth, the murky depths of someone, that something, that is exactly what an abyss is. And she feels that she is about to fall into it, or she fell into it. All right, so that's an articulation again of this unsettlement that people felt over the course of the revolution. Page 140. Page 140. Okay. About... Twelve lines from the top of that page. The adversaries of the revolution were increasingly portrayed as not only wrong but evil. Okay, now this is again, this is already in late 1791. Right, in the beginning, what you do with a nobleman, you appeal to his reason, you reconcile yourself to him. What you do with a refractory priest, you appeal to reason, you try to reconcile yourself to this person. It is, if, if they but understand the, the universal humanity to which the revolution appeals, they will come to our side. Not by page 140 in the textbook. In other words, not by, let's say, the end of 1791. Rosalie Julien's impatience and anger toward the aristocracy. Now, that means the nobility, in effect. Was palpable in the spring of 17, okay, 1790 already spring of 1790, so I've gotten ahead of myself there. The aristocrats are posing so many obstacles, using so many ruses, planning so many horrors that the friends of humanity, truth, and justice can only view them with indignation and anger. All the devils of Milton are but angels compared to the devils 
of the aristocracy. What's Mil who's Milton? There we go. There we go. He wrote Paragra Paradise Lost, right? It's a, a, a long epic poem from the late 17th century in England. All right. So she, she's quite literate if she knows that. But tell me something else about her now. She's indignant. All right. She's indignant with aristocrats. <coughs> I mean, by now, spring of 1790, it's time for them to come over. And everyone can see that we stand for, what is it, humanity, truth, and justice. And they, they want to spoil that. They want to ruin that. Huh? Get out of the way. Get those people out of the way. We're yeah. Got something going here. That's the feeling. That's the feeling. And you get the, the affect of it, the emotion of it, the passion of it. I go on to page 174. This is the fall of the monarchy. So this would have to do then with, uh, you know, the events surrounding the capture, the, the arrest of Louis, 10th of August. 1792, all of the bloodshed attendant upon that, and then, of course, the September massacres when um, <clears throat> ordinary people from, um, from the uh, city government of Paris, uh, but also National Guard who had stopped from elsewhere, who had stopped in Paris on their way to the front, took part in a tremendous massacre of people um, in, in prisons throughout Paris. Uh, on the grounds that they were, uh, they were noblemen themselves, or they, that is, the people whom they massacred were noblemen against the revolution, or priests against the revolution, or common criminals who had, who were, uh, had been paid to become agents of the counter-revolution, and at a signal, they would leave the prisons and come out and stab to death good, honest citizens who were behind the revolution. Right. That's. Those are the September massacres. Let's look now at what she says. Again, page 174. Is that right? Yeah, 174. Five lines from the top. Once again, Rosalie Julien was overcome with that ter terrible confusion of emotions she had known in the summer of 1789. The horror, the pity, the admiration, the joy, the pleasure, the grief and the terrible dangers. She and many of her neighbors were frightened to leave their apartments, and she pleaded with her husband to return from the South, I'm dying with anxiety. What do you get here? What do you get from that, Dylan? Uh, mostly like the bipolarness of this revolution. She's, they're happy and they're scared. And okay. They're angry at everything. But they're okay. Okay. And that, that, that's the presumption that that's the source of happiness. Yeah, bipolarity of emotion, strong feeling. She's pulled in one way, she's pulled in the other way. Fear, and that of course is the central emotion in Tackett's thesis, that people acted because they were so afraid. Yes? Some of it I don't know if they're afraid. I think there is fear, but some of it I think they use it as justification. We're going to kill our enemies and we will justify. Because even afraid, you shouldn't treat people like that. Okay. I, some of it is after the fact. They're like, what we did was horrible. Uh, Why did we do it? Well, we had to do it because. The, the hardest thing in history is to gauge sincerity. But I think they honestly. It's hard to do as a parent, for goodness sake. <laughs> How can you do it in history? You're dealing with, with testimony from 200 years ago. This woman has long since ceased to live. She left some testimony. And we have to come to terms with the motive, really, to leave the testimony that she left. Yes? We do it today. So we see a horror. And it's like, why did we do that? Why did we bomb children? Well, we had to because we were trying to get these. Right. I think some of it is. You look back on this, and I see they see the horror of what they did, and their mind is searching for a justification. And it's like some of it is they're scared, and some of it they look back and say, "Oh, we killed a lot of people. Well, we had to do that to to live with themselves." They find a justification. That could be, that could be, 
And I think we can all understand that that could be. Let me suggest to you that what an historian can register is consistency, not sincerity. That is, consistently, she gives voice to strong emotion. In some cases where there could be a justificatory aspect of it, as you suggest. In other cases when it seems as though the expression of emotion is, um, is um, without that kind of motive. We can say that she and many others whom Tackett quotes consistently voice themselves in, in terms of strong emotion, which has led him to the conclusion that strong emotion has to be included within the causal package of the, the causal picture of the French Revolution. You know, one of the hardest questions that a student has ever posed to me is, let's say I'm teaching a course on National Socialism, you know, the Nazis, Third High teaching that subject all the time. And somebody, and, and I've supplied evidence up one side and down the other of anti-Semitism in Adolf Hitler. And some student says to me, yes, but was he sincere? Which is, of course, a stopper. How do I know if he's sincere? I take him for sincere, but I take him for sincere because of what the documents allow me to say, and that is that he was consistent. He always expressed himself against the Jews. Sincerity is a, a, hard, a hard proof for an historian to undertake. Anyway, let's look on. Let's look on. Where were we? 174. Right. So she's, she's dying with anxiety. Uh, ahead to 197. Um, uh, let's see. OK, it's the bottom of the page. Now this is, okay, the Legislative Assembly is still in existence. Relations between the common, this has to do with this period of August, September 1792 when the commune, in other words, the city government of Paris is so active in calling for severity, execution, or just plain murder of anyone that it regards as an enemy of the revolution. I mean, that's the atmosphere in August, September 1792. When September passes, the violence will abate somewhat, somewhat, but as you know, in the Constitution it returns and with a vengeance. Here's Rosalie Julien, bottom of the page, in a letter to her husband. The representatives were saved by those they represent. Public opinion has now become the enlightened tyrant of the capital. Now this from a woman who in October of 1789 had expressed real misgivings about the involvement of ordinary people, in this case largely women, <coughs> who went to Versailles, seized the royal family, brought them um, three years later. And in the face of extraordinary bloodshed, I mean people were just yanked out of cells and murdered. <coughs> I mean, you saw the description, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400. The, the number is not quite clear. On the presumption that if they were in prison, they were a nobleman who had conspired against the revolution, a priest who had conspired against the revolution, or an ordinary criminal who was in the pay of counter-revolutionaries and set to carry out some kind of plot against the revolution. Just people who were in prison. Without any sense of what we would call due process of law, no, not even a revolutionary tribunal such as would be established later to decide yes or no without appeal on the life of someone. Because sometimes it did decide no on the death verdict, on guilt. But look at this. I mean, look at the remarkable change that she's under. By the way, that phrase, public, I mean, the, the people, she was so skeptical of them, so suspicious of them three years earlier, a kind of yes, but attitude. Now, look, it was, she almost, almost adores the people. Ordinary people, the, the source of the energy by which this revolution lives. I mean, imagine the transformation. That phrase, 
Public opinion has now become the enlightened tyrant of the capital. What do you make out of that phrase, enlightened tyrant? Is the sentence above it kind of describe it? The teacher and the schoolboy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When a schoolboy becomes bigger than his teacher, so much the worse for the teacher. You know, that is a quote from whom? From? Uh, from a representative of the commune. Of the commune, right. So she's, she's using rhetoric very similar to what a radical in the city government, that's the commune, has used. If I use the term enlightened despot, you ever hear that term? What's the idea of an enlightened despot? You often heard that term in the 18th century. Yes? Isn't it somebody who's, it's a reformed monarch who's still keeping absolute monarchy, but they are trying to implement, implement new policies for right. better like have a social contract with the people. Yeah, so okay, the okay. So, so, so power remains vested in the monarchy, but the monarchy has been subject to enlightenment, and the, through enlightenment, the <coughs> monarchy has learned how to improve society, and the monarchy who has you know, the absolute power in the country then decides. Um, we, will, um, we, will, um, uh, we, we will undertake a course of urban renewal in our cities because we all know that cities are better with this kind of lighting and this kind of streets and we will undertake improvements in agriculture because we all know and he will set up some kind of perhaps consultation with ordinary citizens so that the needs of ordinary citizens are known. It was very much like when, when Plato much 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 before this called for a philosopher king much different metaphysics surrounds it but it's the idea that you take advantage of the fact that all power is in one hand by turning that power to good, to good. I mean, Frederick the Great liked to style himself as an, as an enlightened monarch, an enlightened despot. I'm not sure anyone ever said enlightened tyrant, but you get the idea. And he set up, for example, an academy of scholarship in, in, in Potsdam, which was the court outside Berlin. Um, <laughs> Many of the sovereigns of the smaller German states set themselves up as absolute monarchs. They, in some way, eased the burden on the peasantry. They, in some way, uh, improved agriculture. They issued law codes, established new courts. All of this enlightenment. Well, you get so you get the context enlightened here. It's the people, ordinary people, who have just carried out a massacre, who are being called enlightened. Brian, and then Victor. Pardon me. Public opinion can be especially capricious. Right. So he that changes from day to day, that's the tyrant right. part. Yeah. Well, the tyrant um, wasn't always negative either. What? Greek and Roman tyrant didn't mean negative originally. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly it's not negative. It's not a negative connotation yeah, here at all. It's negative here. It's yeah. I mean, she's, I mean, the, the people have saved us. The representatives were saved by those they represent. I mean, the revolution was saved by the people in whose name they've carried out the revolution. Remarkable. Remarkable. Okay, 209 to 210. You know, I, I, I've got a whole slew of these references here. I think this will be the last one I, I use, and then we'll... <coughs> then we'll take a 10 minute break and then I, I do want to go through this paper topic but I've got some other topics I want to raise with you as well. But okay, this is the first terror. Yeah, we're still basically in the section on uh, you know, the arrest of the king in August, the massacre of prisoners in September 1792. Here she is, she's again at the bottom of the page. Rosalie Julienne was beside herself with anguish. As the guardsmen pursued their rounds, their drums reverter reverberated so insistently, she wrote, that it sounded like rain beating down in the streets. Agitated by the tumult outside, no one was able to sleep. All the women remain at their windows, looking out for the enemies whose imminent arrival everyone was now predicting. So here she is in the, in the, in the effect of one of these rumors that, you know, the the, the enemies are upon us, the counter-revolution, the Prussians are here, the Austrians are here. 
you know, the, the priests at the head of an army, and so forth. The drums, these are you know, drums of, you know, of alarm being sounded for the people. So let's take 10 minutes. Let's come, well, let's come back at 310, okay? 310. I guess that gives you about eight minutes. And then uh, I want to raise these, these other questions with you, in particular the paper topic. so much. I really do. Last time I took a test on the whole world, like everything was okay when reading, I was a senior in high school. Going back. So I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Just search the soft copy as opposed to thumb through it. Uh, that's much easier. Really? Yeah. I'm just like, I can't. That is a very awesome shirt. I love that. Second time. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I've been wearing this, I've been wearing this for like three days straight. Been yeah. to bed because I've been so lazy to change. That's what I do with my morning. Yeah. I just wear that when I'm being lazy. I'm reading but it, do you I know which, um, off the top of your head, what the range of pages we're supposed to read for tomorrow? Or <laughs> yes. Uh, so finishing Mitter, um, the entire Forgotten Ally. And then Is it like 140 India. some odd? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like 140. It doesn't take long to finish. Yeah. And then India at War, it's like till page 60. Oh, my, wait, what's our next book that we're supposed to read? Is that for also... Then it's this one, and then it's War Without Mercy after this. Okay, because what, I'm trying to figure out what book I have to, well, we should all be reading one, it, but. Yeah. I think this, because um, we have another excerpt from this one, and then War Without Okay. Do you know what the oh, next yeah. question like, is? You're probably not, just it's not it. yours, like, yeah, I know. to do. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's like to page 60. It's through chapter 5, because I'm on. Now we're going to have this paper. So I you guys really didn't have the coming of the like fourth like British Empire. They would just <laughs> laminate them like they do for libraries. I, I totally, really I always take mine off because they bother me so much that yeah. I just, I remove them. But then I, you know, my book is dirty now. Mm. Trip to the bummer. Oh. Yeah. It's, 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 so this is the last chapter we have to read. Oh, okay. It's oh. Yeah, it's pretty easy to read so far. Like, yeah. like that didn't take Oh, I never do that. Um, I'm getting really used to it. Like, yeah, we do. Yeah, same That's here. That's what I did for all of this book. Yeah. Wait. I'm actually like pleasantly surprised so far how much of it. I feel like I'm tracking pretty well. Where things are going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like last, well, I have to say with Mitter last class was Wait, like, what it was book so is helpful that? to have that. India at War. Okay, so for now I need to read Dower. And that's, that's, that is the War Without War. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, because how would you compare American attitudes towards the Japanese and the Chinese? That would be more doubt, right? Because, yeah, okay. Thank God. Because I, I have not even read that. Okay. I don't know. I mean, you definitely mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like we didn't even that, finish yeah. this book. I think we're going to be okay. I wonder if we have it again later, but it's like I'm I don't like the way that they're teaching the class. I don't. 
It's, yeah, it's yeah, different. You know, and but I, that's not what I, I can't learn from that. Like, I want to interact. Yeah. And I actually am, like, I'm still trying to learn, but I'm less interested. That's what I'm, I love history. Yeah, almost like it's harder, but more of a challenge. I don't know, do you, do we even participate in? Well, I kept thinking it's just sound. It's just such a good idea. I just have to wait. I mean, it's more snow than that. I've never had it. I'm really special. It says, look and start. It's one of the best times of the world. It's pretty small. I couldn't believe it. Can I mean, it's something that's around the class. I know. Yeah. And I have no idea. Or you can be the first time that it's camped. Like Michelle. Yeah, same case. Yeah, he has a face. He's looking at it. So, uh, I don't on. know how, how, how do we size the bridge? Wait, that's the pieces. Yeah, yeah. Well, without mercy, grace and power in the power this specific war. I was out all day yesterday. I think that book's online. Anyway, let me yeah, get so these. Yeah, so you guys don't have it. Okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh, all right, everybody. Cool. Oh, no, it started the first time. It started the first time. It started the You can read them. Oh, hell yeah. So, oh. I don't think I'm going to keep it. At least every class that's been open, I already have a matter. Okay. All right, everyone. This is it. I'm This is it. I have prepared a, a paper topic for you, and I want to go through it. Well, wait a second. Let me do something else first. Do you know that next week you have a rather light reading assignment? Light in comparison with what you have. <laughs> is this book, The French Revolution in Global Perspective, edited by Suzanne Dessan. Uh, she's the first editor, and then some other editors. This is the assignment I would like to give. All, all of you need to read the introduction, pages 1 to 12. All of you. If your last name begins A through H, a through H, then I would like you to read, please, chapters, hold on, one and three. So in other words, all of you read the introduction. If your last name begins A through H, read chapters one and three. Not one through three, one and three. Two oh, chapters. Okay. If your last name begins I through Q, read chapters 5 and 7. Again, just two chapters, 5 and 7. And if your last name begins R through Z, read chapters 8 and 9. Okay? So that's what you're, what you're called upon to do for next week in terms of reading. You read an introduction in two chapters, and which two they are is based on the first letter of your last name. Now, I mean, I do not mean to discourage you or in some way ban you from the chapters that I have not assigned in your case. That's up to you. You know, go ahead, read, read the rest of them, read, read anything you like for that matter. But um, in terms of our discussion, that's what I'll, what I'll look for, okay? That's what I'll look for. But some of you will have, I can be sure that some of you will have looked at 1 and 3, some of you will have looked at 5 and 7, some of you will have looked at 8 and 9. And we can proceed on that basis. Now, the paper topic. Okay, would you take one, please? Oh, I'm sorry, and, and hand the rest of them along, too. Just, <laughs> all right, each of you has, has, you know, 20 seconds to memorize that. <laughs> no, you'll, you'll get this handed around. And then, then things get interesting, no, no less interesting because there are nine of you, 13, 16 of you, and eight are not here. Let me say, by the way, um, John Callahan off campus, I need to contact you with this assignment, but also you can deal with me as your referee. That is, when you are done with the rough draft, send it to me. I'll send back comments. 
you will respond or however you wish to those comments. And then, then the final draft. You complete the, yeah. the entire assignment, but with me as your referee. Yes? Can we send it to Andrea, too? Andrea, Andrea. Is she not in here anymore? Yeah. Um, yes, she is in here. Um, it's set up so that this time she's not in the loop. She will be in the loop each of the two other times. Oh, okay. And the reason is, frankly, that I've created such a choreography around this course of this week we do this, and that week we do that, and then, then we do the other thing. But I just couldn't see how to fit you know, one, more <laughs> one more loop in. So this time, she's not part of it. But she okay. will. Uh, she, well, Andrea will certainly, I mean, I don't have her hours to hand, but when did she say she would be? Mondays? Mondays 3 to 4, and where will she be? In the UCCS coffee shop? Is that what you have in your notes? I don't have those to hand. She sent it out in an email. If you she sent it out in an yeah. email, too. Okay, okay. Well, then, I mean, she certainly will be plugging in to the assignment, but she won't be, you won't be turning it into her. But she can certainly help you with the rough draft. Yeah. Um, or if you want, she can, she can help you with the final draft. But the idea of this is you are helping each other with the rough draft so that, uh, that, is, so that you can write the final draft, whether or not you ask Andrea or whether or not you approach me in addition. All right, let me go through this. Let me go through this. Consider the list of witnesses in the long paragraph on page two, 9 of TAC, okay? We were just at that paragraph several minutes ago. Setting aside Rosalie Julien, whom we discussed in class, choose one of the other three as the subject for your analysis. Adrien Joseph uh, Colson, Nicolas Rouault, Gilbert Rome. Okay? Those three. Your assignment is to proceed with the one you have chosen in the same way that we proceeded with Rosalie Julien in class, namely to locate the passages in which Tackett addresses that person as given in the index. <coughs> Excuse me. Your paper is to be written on that basis. And it needs to put forth an argument. That argument will be your answer to this question. Given the evidence that Tackett presents, as the revolution changed course, how did this person's view of it change? And do you also see principles and attitudes that stayed the same? Or do you see those changing as well? That you have to answer, whether you pick Colson, Rouault, or Rome. OK? Pick the one you like. That's, no, that's your decision, not mine. But then you answer that question. Remember, I go on to say, this is argumentative writing. The goal is not to offer a mere list of the items that Tackett includes as evidence, but on the basis of that evidence to reach a conclusion, to offer a general insight, to establish a clear perspective on how this person responded to the French Revolution as it unfolded. Do the responses reveal a change? Can you see basic principles or attitudes that continue through various responses? Or do the principles and attitudes appear to change? For example, does your individual start out as a champion of liberty, but once the war begins, care only about security? I'm not sure that that's true for any of the three, but that would be an example of a way that you would think about an individual in the French Revolution. Does your person seem more humane or generous in 1789 than in 1793, 1794? That would be a way to think about a person, if that question makes sense in regard to your individual. The clarity of an argument depends in large part on organization. Use the introduction to introduce your person. Who is he? Then I say in parentheses, there is no room here or anywhere in your paper for a summary of the French Revolution which would take up too much space. Okay? So when you think about whom I whom I am I addressing here? about this individual in the French Revolution, you're addressing me. And I just read the book you read, and I've got an idea of what these events are, and you don't have to go on. You don't have to start with, in 1789, France was a monarchy. You don't have to do that, OK? You can assume that those things have, that, that a general outline is already 
in, in the mind of the reader, and then you go into your person. Then, and then to state the argument in general but definite terms. Will you describe changes or not? Will you establish a consistent adherence to some principle or basic attitude or not? Supply answers in general terms. That constitutes your argument. Think of the argument as a paper, of a paper as the answer to some question. And in this question, I supplied, in this case, I supplied the question in bold print at the end of the first, chapter, first paragraph of this prompt. All right? It's how you answer it. To put it in general terms at the bottom of a first introductory paragraph, that's the argument. That's what that is. Not this paper will deal with Huo, who was a book dealer in, or a, was a bookseller, book, or was a book printer. In any case, with Huo, who was whatever he was in Paris, and we will see various changes. No, that's not an argument. That, that identifies a topic. State what you will conclude. State what perspective you will offer on this individual at the very foot of the first introductory paragraph. This is what is often called a thesis statement. Indeed, I think in composition it generally is called a thesis statement. So far what you have done is to present some basic points in the introductory paragraph. Now, go on to develop them in the body of the paper. In other words, the series of paragraphs between the introductory paragraph and the conclusion. This would be paragraphs two through whatever, four, five, six, however, however many you have. And you only have a three, page, three to four page paper, so this isn't going to be, it's not as though you're going to stick, you know, 22 paragraphs in, into the body of the paper. Each of these paragraphs will have the role of developing one point essential to your argument. For example, this person remained a proponent of the constitutional monarchy until the king tried to flee France. I don't know if, offhand if that's true about any of the three, but that would be the example of a topic sentence that states a point that is essential to your argument. Begin the paragraph with an effective topic sentence and then dole out your evidence. <coughs> Quotations are effective but need to be kept brief. Brief there in bold print. Or else they take space from your analysis, right? The trouble with a, if you have a short paper and you have long quotations and you've left yourself so little space to draw attention to what's important in the quotation. And that you need to look to avoid. With each quotation, identify very briefly when the statement was made and what the situation was to which the person was responding. That is, this came in response to the October events when ordinary women from Paris brought the royal family back to the capital for supervision by the assembly. All right? You don't, if again, if you go on and on, then, you know, what, what room have you left yourself to <coughs> analyze the quotation, whatever it is? At the end of your paper, offer a conclusion, restate the argument, but not in the exact same terms you used in the introduction. I can't tell you how many times I get an echo in the conclusion from the introduction. They sort of, so-and-so was happy when the revolution broke out in 1789, but became less happy in 1791 because of such and such, and really became depressed about the revolution in 1792. And then I get, and the conclusion, this person was very happy when the revolution broke out. <laughs> and you think, yeah. <laughs> am I in an echo chamber or what? <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're restating the argument, but used for, for purposes of style. You use different terms than you had used in the initial statement of the argument. Okay. Provide the draft you have completed to student referee by next week, Wednesday, February the 10th, at the latest. Well, no, I mean, just any time. I think any time on, I mean, since this is kind of going on aside from class, any time on February the 10th, one week from today. All right? So what's going to, pardon? Well, that you'll find out in a moment. I'll, I'll assign that, divide that out 
all of you will be a student referee for someone and in turn have a student referee. One person to referee for and one student as your referee. Okay? So you, each of you will be connected two ways in class. And I'm about to get to that. Now look, look to the next to the next page, please, that is the other side of this sheet. Instructions for student referee. You have to convey to the student <coughs> whose draft you have read some suggestions for improvement <coughs> by Wednesday, February 17th at the latest. Those suggestions, which should be in clear prose at 100 to 200 words in length, are to deal with the following. The clarity of the argument, the adequacy of the evidence, and the explanations that are offered with it, the effectiveness of the writing. Be constructive, please. All right? So 100 to 200 words of your clear prose that goes to the person whose rough draft you have read, whose referee you are, in the effort to help that person. Constructive criticism. Let's say on one hand, we have a student referee who says, this is the best piece of writing that I have ever read. Not since Thucydides has anyone written history as effectively and as beautifully as this person. I worship the ground that this person walks upon. <laughs> That would be too much in one direction. You will agree. In the other direction, I can't believe this person was graduated beyond the fifth grade. And in the next thousand words, I will give you a number of reasons why. That's too hard. That's too severe, right? We want something in between where you encourage the person. You know, you might even note some things that the person has done well. You know, there at the bottom of page two, you use the, the evidence very effectively. Top of page three, though, I was unsure that you had used the best evidence you could find for the point that, that you were making there. All right? I mean, they, you often do that when you, you know, draw attention to what is good so the student has, as it were, his or her own example from his or her own work of what worked as against what did not. And I think with any paper, you can find 100 or 200 words worth of things to say. Try to, suggest, try to support, try to build up. I mean, that's the idea of, of the student referee. Again, John, off campus, I will serve as your student referee. Yeah. When we have the same referee throughout the whole time, will it change presentation? That happens only once. That is, there, only, there is only one assignment of a referee. And again, it's because you know, to, to make this course, um, what's it called? Writing, writing intensive, right? By the way, the, the meeting about when they were going to approve this was put off until February 29th, so I am still confident. But they, they have certain rules. And I also have then a writing fellow who is Andrea, and she's got to be worked into this too, to your advantage. And I thought, if I have everybody, first I want you to get with the referee. Then I want you to get with Andrea. Then I want you to get with the referee again. Then I want you to get with me. And I think then all of a sudden I've extended this out into like August. <laughs> and I, so I couldn't, I couldn't do it all. So no, there's only once that you will act as a, this whole referee system will be in place only once. Um, just for the sake of time. Yeah. Do you want a bibliography or can we just do footnotes? That's fine. That's fine. You, you, you have only one source. Right. And I will not be a stickler on bibliography. Any kind of notes you want to supply, parenthetical <laughs> notes, footnotes, and notes, anything consistent, that's fine. Mm, title page? That's fine if you want. I mean, sort of, you know, I mean, a title itself would be good. Yeah, title would be good. Um, other questions about form. What's really important here is what you write, the analysis that you supply. Um, that's what's really important here. Now, um, let me see. Let me see. I'm sure I'm not forgetting anyone. Okay. Yeah. My pen. Okay. Okay. 
Reminds me that I shoveled a lot of snow yesterday. Um, at this point, are you clear about the assignment? All right, all right. <coughs> this is all on Blackboard, by the way, as of about uh, 1 o'clock today. By the way, those of you off campus, well, I'll have to send an email to this effect. I have asked whether or not there is any way to get this course through streaming. And as of right now, um, Ben, who runs this operation, will look into it. At one point, some semesters back, it was on YouTube. And I, I think that's being looked into, but I'm not sure at this time. All I know now is Comcast Channel 20 and then the rebroadcast at Friday afternoon, which I think starts about 3 o'clock if I'm not wrong. That's all I know right now in terms of the broadcast of this, of this course. All right. Edmund, I would like you, now you're going to have to then, you know, exchange emails, right? Both ways, the person for whom you are the referee and your referee. Okay, Edmund, I'd like you to have Cameron, please, as your referee. That means you send a, you send a draft to Cameron, right here, within the next week. It's due on February the 10th, okay? And, and keep these dates, keep these dates. The last thing any of us want is a series of... Um, you know, con confusions and turmoil around, um, um, you, you know, referees not meeting deadlines, students sending papers not on deadline. Let's, let's, let's keep the system functioning. <coughs> Particularly referees, oh, you have to respond to your person, right? It's not fair to that person if you don't. Think of it that way. Um, okay, so we've got Edmund with Cameron, the referee. Cameron with Brian, right there in the back, right there in the corner, wearing the Oregon. Brian is your referee. So send your paper along to Brian when you're done with it. Brian, send your paper to Erica, right here in the back, right in the middle. Brian sends the paper to Erica, his referee. Erica sends the paper to Dylan. Her referee, Dylan in the cap, right here. Okay? You see Erica back there? Okay, there we go, there we go. Dylan sends his paper to Dune, right here, right, your referee. Dune, you send your paper to Andrea, who's back there. I don't know if you can see Andrea. She's right there. She's, she's craning her neck for you. There you go. Okay, so you send your paper to Andrea, your referee. Andrea, <coughs> you send your paper, well, okay, this is Danielle Gregory. And um, she's not here today. She's not well today. But she's very active and um, with an extraordinary display of technological acuity. I'm going to hand you a copy of her. Um, email address so you know where to send it, okay? <coughs> when I was in graduate school, we had whole seminars about how to do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here you go. Here you go. Danielle is her name. Very approachable. I'm sure she will be a good referee. Danielle, if you are listening, um, you will send your paper to Rihanna. And Rihanna, you are the referee of Danielle. And here, in fact, I, I'd like, if, if you get one of these, just contact the person, okay? That'll make this, if you would contact Danielle, Andrea, and you would contact Danielle in your respective roles, I think this will, this will not be too, it's, it's too bad that we're doing this in this, you know, post-blizzard condition. But okay, so that took care of that. Now. Brianna, 
you will send your paper to Fallon right here. Wait, there we go. <laughs> okay. There's Fallon. Fallon is your referee. Fallon, you will send yours to Sidney Hellman. <coughs> uh, I think, well, I'm going to have to contact you and her. I don't have her email address because most people got in touch with me. But, but I'll, I'll get with that then. And Sidney Hellman, if you happen to be listening in, you will send yours to Cassidy, who is not here because she had a car problem. So I'll have to get, get with you about Cassidy. OK. Cassidy, if you happen to be listening in, you will send yours to Ryan Johnston, who also had car trouble. You have that in common. <laughs> and Ryan. That is, Cassidy, your referee will be Ryan. Ryan, you will send yours to Austin Lacoste, who is right here. He will be your referee. Okay, so I will give you Ryan's email. And Austin, if you would get in touch with him, please, and tell him that you're the referee. So at some point within the next week, it should come, come to you. Then Austin, you will send yours to Joe. Right here. Right? Okay. He is your referee. Joe, you will send yours to Jennifer Morrison, who is not here because she too has had trouble with the weather. And I have a copy of her email address for you. And again, please get in touch with this person, whether you're the referee or this person is, is your referee, because I think that will make this whole thing go with a little less confusion. I'm sending my paper to her. That's right. That's right. She is your referee. And then Jennifer Morrison off campus, you're sending yours to Allison Schoner, who is also not here. Um, Allison. Shoner, who is Jennifer Morrison's referee, you are sending yours to Lindsay Shelton. Uh, Lindsay, here you go. All right, so she's sending me her paper. That's right. Got it. And if you would contact her and just kind of make an initial sort of contact, that would, that would help. Mm -hmm. OK. So that's Allison sending her paper to Lindsay, who is her referee. Lindsay, you send yours to Victor, right there behind you, the man behind you to the that's right. That's my email. OK, thank you. OK. What's yours? And Victor. You send your paper, please, to Amy, who is right here. See all these, all these uh, gestures of togetherness. Okay, Victor, you send your paper, please, to Amy, who is right here in the front. Okay, so she should get your email address. There we go. She is your referee. Amy, you should send your paper to Caitlin, please, who is right here. I'm losing my okay. microphone here. Okay, Caitlin is your referee, in other words. Um, Caitlin, you send your paper to Dennis. Right back there. Give her a wave. There we go. So Dennis is your re referee. Dennis, you send your paper, please, to Robert Hopkins, who is not here today. But I will give you. I have a feeling that the next several minutes after this class, I'm going to be spending on my email trying to sort out the relationships, but here is, here is his email address. So 
just you know you might just send him a send him a message please saying hi I'm you know you're my referee and I'll send this along to you again his name is Robert um, then Robert Hopkins if you are listening you'll send your paper to Isabella Dow who is also not here today she is your referee Isabella Dow you send yours to Edmund and Edmund, I will give you Isabella Dow's. I'll do the same thing. No, you just have to get it. Thanks. Isn't it that you don't look at that one very much? No. Okay. This is Isabella Dow's email. Thank you. All right. Just like a well oiled machine, wouldn't you say? <laughs> could have been simpler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. There you go. All right, I sent you an email. You sent me an email? No. Oh, you sent him an email. Or her. Yeah. What is it, Danielle? Danielle. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she'll be, yeah, she's. So, you know, be be supportive of one another in this. Now, yeah. let's, um, now, you have all heard about your reading. Us. Yes, Joe. The, the assignment page you handed out, is that on Blackboard? Yes. Yeah, that's on Blackboard. That's on Blackboard. And those of you off campus, that may well be the way you get it. Um, you know, I wanted you to, to ask you a question. I mean, I, I frame this question by reminding you about two things of the revolution. The place of women in the history of the revolution is complex. The National Assembly, then Constituent Assembly, the Legislative Assembly, and the National Convention. These were the three <coughs> assemblies <coughs> that each served in effect as the parliament of France during these year, years. Not one extended the vote to women. Not one extended the ability to women, acknowledged the ability of women to serve as a deputy. In that sense, sense, feminism, by which I mean here a movement for rights of women, equality for women, feminism was shut down at the level of ultimate authority in revolutionary France. But we know that it's a little more complex than that because we see that women took part in in a number of ways. For example, those women from, the, from you know, ordinary women from Paris, women of you know, low standing in society, uh, they actually led the march, you know, hundreds of them, the march out to, um, out to Versailles in October 1789 to, to, to seize the king. We know that women took part in the seizure of the Bastille on the 14th of July, 1789. We know that women were active not in the assemblies, but rather in the sections, in other words, in the, uh, in the neighborhood organizations <coughs> in Paris throughout the revolution. We know that women were active in the political clubs, such as the, as the Cordelier Club and the Jacobin Club. Um, and we know that to some extent, women had the support of some men in these steps that they took to be politically active during the revolution. The highest assemblies, however, put a quash on all of that. They assumed that the exercise of power was the province of men and not of women. So we have in the revolution a remarkable spectacle of, on the one hand, articulation of a feminist position, or positions, I should say, and on the other hand, severity in the response to those positions to the extent that some of the leaders of feminism were in fact led to the guillotine in 1793, 1794. That I put before you. Something else to put before you. The abolition of slavery following three years after the acknowledgement of citizenship on the part of free blacks in, well, throughout France, including including colonial France, including a colony like Saint-Domingue. That makes the revolution very, rev very radical for its day. Now, before we romanticize the revolutionaries of 1794, we should point out that what they were responding to was in effect a fait accompli anyway. That is, 
slaves had seized their power in a place like Saint-Domingue and to a degree in other colonies. And the revolutionaries were putting a stamp of authority where they really had no ability to do anything. If they were going to act at all, that was the only action that made sense or made much sense under the circumstances where they were. Some of you, I can't remember who's reading which chapter from the volume by Suzanne de Saint, The Global Perspective, but some of you will see that in <coughs> French Guiana, the liberation of slaves meant something less than the liberation of slaves. But it did not always play out quite that way in a colony where the, Fran where the slaves <laughs> had not seized power and in this way enforced their liberty as was the case in Saint-Domingue, which in short order would become the independent country of Haiti. All of this in the way to frame, my, to frame the discussion. You, you've seen so much about the revolution. You've seen its assault upon the church. You've seen not one constitution, but three that um, um, really put, um, well really, but two constitutions, one 1792, 1791, excuse me, one 1793. You've seen three assemblies, two constitutions. It, it, it is extraordinary the, <coughs> the sheer variety of constitutional government that the revolution established. We've spoken about the, the, the question of the poor. That question being, one, should the poor man exercise any kind of political liberty, political right, and two, did the poor man have any kind of right upon material assistance from the government against the background of hardship, hunger, disease, malnutrition, and so forth? In effect, th the government was very awkward in the steps it took to answer this question in favor of the poor man. But in 1793, issued a constitution that guaranteed the poor man the right to vote alongside men of higher means, although a democratic election was never held, but let's set that aside for a moment. And that also at least attempted in some faulty, uh, uh, halting way to deal with the food crisis of the poor, if by no other means than to send out troops to scour the basin around Paris for grain, bring that grain in, grind it to flour, and sell it at a set price, well below the price that could be asked for flour on the black market. I, I would point out to you that all of these are incipient moments of a, of a welfare state. There's that action, but also the idea that the government needed to um, see to the provision of orphans and widows. So the government needed to, uh, at some point, supply <coughs> school teachers for every Canton in uh, in France, so that um, so that poor children could enjoy an education alongside rich. If you get the idea that the revolution is variety, then you've gotten that idea. Now a point. Now a question to ask about you know, about all of this. What's the sense of all this? What do you get all of this? What's the legacy of all of this? I mean, in France, for example, they celebrate the 14th of July, 1789. They celebrate the seizure of the Bastille. In France, the question is urgent. Do you support the revolution or not? Do you accept that as the founding event of modern French democracy, the current French Republic? Do you accept that? Do you, sec do you accept that the revolution is that event? And if not, why not? And if so, what part of the revolution do you support? Do you support Robespierre? Which Robespierre? The one who had a hand in the authoring of a democratic constitution in 1793? <coughs> or the man who more than any other, any other was associated with the guillotine in 1793-1794? Do you divide out a good Robespierre? Imagine if you were a school teacher in France and it was upon you to teach French history. Right? Today we will take up the good Robespierre. On Monday we will take up the bad Robespierre. <laughs> you know, how, you know, to, in, in a way, I mean, I suppose at a university level, yes, I want to be coherent. I hardly, I hardly leave the room and think, boy, I hope I confused them today. But 
Of course I want coherence about our teaching, but we can let coherence float a little bit in view of complexity. That's fair to expect of ourselves at the university level. But if, imagine if you were the equivalent of an eighth grade teacher of history in, um, in France. Um, how would you handle a character like Robespierre? And what would you memorialize? In effect, what I want all of you to be is, in a way, French right now, and to think about how you would identify the legacy of the French Revolution. And it, go, it works throughout France, throughout France, throughout France. I, I, I can't remember when it was. It was years ago. I was reading about the effort to ban um, not only the burqa itself, but every form of, you know, of headscarf as a religious ornament <clears throat> from instruction, which I must say to me as an American, that seems absolutely crazy to want to do that in a school or, or a yellow, or a, a, um, a Star of David or a crucifix or something like that. To me, it seems absolutely crazy to want to do that. That just, it, it seems just wrong-headed um, from the standpoint of religious tolerance. But the French had become, you know, by 1791, 1792, so bent on this idea of a secular society that um, limits expression of religion in, in, in any sort of public arena, that it's against that background that that policy could even be considered. Or the liberation of slaves. I mean, let's face it, that's a taint on our Constitution, but not on theirs. They liberated them in 1794. In that one regard, a clean slate. The severity toward women, well, maybe you write that off because it was the 18th century. But that a feminist should be led to the guillotine, like Olympe de Gouges was led to the guillotine, famous feminist author of the 1790s, led to the guillotine. Well, I mean, what do you think of all this revolution? What do you find worthwhile? Or what do you simply find an influence for later time? How would you take it, Eric? Yeah. With, um, you know, the, so the revolution took place, and now they're at war, and now they're just going to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. It seems a little childish. But they conquered a lot of the world. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I Tell that to my Germans where I used to live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then, well, like the poor, how they wanted to be the primary law makers then. So, um, not that that's not a lofty goal, but at the same time, I think, I don't know, I think a lot of high hopes. High hopes, okay. <coughs> well, can high hopes be, be, be the basis for a legacy that you bequeath to the French down until 2016 and beyond, and to, to the world. What do we stand for? We stand for high hopes. I'm not saying that's a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, just, I, think, I think just maybe different Yeah, OK, OK. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, may, I think someone said this, maybe it was Brian at the beginning, I can't remember who, I think others chimed in, that the American Revolution, by contrast, seems very realistic. I mean, look at the Constitution and the attention that is lavished on the question of how you constitute the Electoral College. <laughs> um, that's quite something. Um, and. You, you know, as though once the basic idea of liberty had been, uh, had been enunciated, the rest of it was nuts and bolts work to try to set up a government that would have some chance to last. 
in, in France, we see this merry-go-round of governments. And it's really only started with the fall of Robespierre because, you know, the, in the falls of government that you've seen so far, because it, it goes on through, through di the directory and then the various forms by which Napoleon exercised his authority until the emperor, empire. And then he was cast aside, but after 100 days he returned. It's quite a story. It's quite a story. Um, this idea that the France, French Revolution can seem comical because it, um, may, may I, may I, may I, um, may I assume that when you say comical, <coughs> what you find comical about some of it is that it's so extreme. Okay. Well, could a Frenchman look at, or a French woman look at the French Revolution and say, yes, 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 it often went to extremes. But there was a, there, there was a moment here. There was an essence here that you know, b before it lurched towards extremes. And that's what we, what we celebrate. Would that make sense? Say, yes, 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 but I mean 1789, not 1793. I mean the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, not, not the terror. Because we're left with the fact that the French do uphold 1789 and do uphold the French Revolution as their founding moment, just like we do. Uphold the American Revolution as our founding moment, or like the Germans uphold really the defeat of Hitler as their founding moment. That makes Germany a very strange country in a way because its founding moment consists in ruins. But, you know, I think it's, it's, that's been a big help to them. <laughs> yeah. I, if I had words to describe the French Revolution, it'd be political vacuum. That's political like, which? Political vacuum. Okay. That's the difference between America and the French. America, it's like, okay, we're all organized. We're fighting this. We're done. Here's what we want. Yeah. The French, it's like, we don't want you. You're gone. Now, what do we want? Yeah. I mean, that's certainly true. And I think probably if we surveyed the biography of, let's say, the men at the Constitution, at the Constitutional Convention, and I, I, I'd have to ask, you know, an Americanist colleague if this was so. I think there was probably more in the way of preparation, not through the war itself, but in various um, colonial assemblies, than was the case among the French. They did seem like novices in power, that's for sure. Lindsay and then Joe. Um, I think one word that comes to term to my mind, it's kind of random, but admiration. Um, I think they were trying to do something no one else had done, yeah. and it was a daunting task. Yeah, yeah. And you, it was bound to have some of what happened. It just is human nature, but I mean, they tried. They, I mm. mean, they continued to try to change something that they, yeah. you know, were, people use the word today: yeah. political revolution. It has some of the quality of a space mission, doesn't it? Although it not. Does. You know, not Armstrong on the moon, more like, you ever see the movie Interstellar? <laughs> Where, you know, it's just sort of wildly risky <laughs> what, what's undertaken. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure that that's what many French say. When, you know, they, they, they take stock of Robespierre, they take stock of the terror, the September massacres, you know, all the excess of the French Revolution, then, you know, later Napoleon, but they say, Yes, but. And then they say something like you said. You know, this idea that at its heart there's an effort to free humanity from shackles that had existed at the past. And it went to excess. There was no preparation for it. But at its heart, it was strong enough to leave a legacy. You need proof? Look around you. Yeah. Okay, stability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, <coughs> I think it also shows how much people are willing to put up with. With um, you know, people were really excited about the revolution. And you know, this France is going to modernize and all those things. 
68, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But after a while, I with all that turmoil, it really reflects a more conservative sort of concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the French do have their moments at the, their time at the barricade. Uh, and yeah, you're right about. Uh, 1968 in Paris, there was a, there was an unprecedented degree of cr- connection between student radicalism and worker radicalism, and you know, Paris was quite um, quite in turmoil at that time in the future for France. Yeah, I mean France has certainly, uh, you know, I mean th- this, you know, when I started graduate school, I had not been a history major, so I was you know a little hazy on the kinds of you know, the basic narrative of some of these European countries that I thought I should be more or less expert in. And when I sat down, I realized there's been so, there have been so many governments in France. I mean, if you, if you call, if, if you will agree for sake of argument to say that what happened in 1792 is the first republic, all right, after, and that Robespierre was, so to speak, the head of the first republic, well, what, what else was it? It wasn't the monarchy, he was dead. But, and then you go to, um, let's see, the, the directory until 1795, and then, you, uh, or excuse me, until 1799, and then you go to the um, um, consulship, which included Napoleon, and then Napoleon was first consul for life, and then he was emperor, and then he was out, and there was Bourbon Restoration, and then Napoleon came back for about 100 days, and then he was really out for the Bourbon Restoration, then there was the July Monarchy, then there was the Second Republic, then there was the Second Empire under his nephew, Louis Napoleon, then there was the Third Republic, that lasted until 1940. Then, of course, the Nazis occupied. Then there was the Fourth, then there was the, so you just kind of go cuckoo. With just, you know, you think when you were a child having to learn the presidents of the United States was a trick, you know, where was Millard Fillmore after all? Um, think about a child in France just being made dizzy by the profusion of government. But of course, this one has existed for, well, what would it be, I guess, approaching 70 years. So a relative eternity. Uh, against the backdrop of French history. Yes? I was just going to say something I might not be kind of going back to this idea of legacy. Yeah. How do you define that and what do you look for? It seems to me like, of course, as a French person, you'd want to cherry pick the good things. Mm-hmm. Maybe yes, but, and mm-hmm. say, these are the things that you need to work for. And clearly, clearly the, the good and the bad have had an impact on the current psychological and political world. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, talking about, oh yeah, we did so many things, right? Well, they didn't allow women to vote. They didn't allow women to vote until after World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a legacy that took a really long time to overcome. Yes, yes, yes. And so there is there is a good and a bad legacy. Right, right. Right, right. Yeah, and I suppose the French have to subtly work through issues like that in the same that we have to work through. It was a great constitution, but there was slavery. You know that we have to work through that. So, uh, I mean, n- nothing ever shines quite the way it should in history, I suppose. Um, their burden to bear and their ad- their reason for admiration and satisfaction, as you point out, is maybe per t- perhaps very very complex. But that's what we've been talking about. Let me tell you about something I did this summer. I went to France for three days. I was in the midst of a of a research trip in Europe which centered in Germany because that's my field, but I wanted to do some things in France. Some things I'd, I'd always wanted to do in eastern France, northeastern France. I went to um, the battle site of the World War I battle at Verdun, which was a story for another day. I went to a city called uh, <coughs> Lunéville, which is where one of the brothers of Napoleon, I think it was, God, I think it was Joseph, signed a treaty with the Austrians in 1801. I'd always been curious to see it. And you know what it was? Nothing. A big fat nothing. Uh, It was a little plaque in a building that otherwise housed things like lawyers, officers, and and, uh, notary publics. (laughs) 
<laughs> struck by how little attention history had accorded to that, what I thought was a pretty important event. And I wanted to go to Colmar, which is sort of the number two city, and that's what I'm getting to, in the province of Alsace, which is in the northeast, fought over by Germany and France since, um, since the 17th century. And I wanted to go with it, to go there for really, a, I mean, research would be too strong a word. There is an extraordinary um, altar tri triptych by the um, 15th century German painter Matthias Grunewald, which is kept there. And I've always seen and admired reproductions of it. I wanted to see it. So I spent uh, you know, an hour or so just studying these remarkable uh, parts of the, of the altar. It's called the Isenheimer Altar by Matthias Grunewald. I just couldn't, I mean, it's been a feast for the eye, eyes ever since I knew it existed. And I got to see it, you know, in, on, the, on the canvas. It was great. But I, as I got, I didn't, I mean, Colmar's a nice city. I'd been there before, but I got there, there was kind of a, a, a festival going on. People through the streets downtown, uh, bands everywhere you turned, people <clears throat> walking the streets, families arm in arm, everybody in, in full enjoyment. It was really quite a day. Um, and I, of course, was looking for some place to do my laundry and having, having a lot of trouble. <laughs> but um, I, um, I, I stopped in for, for, for dinner at a little restaurant downtown. And um, it was a restaurant that, that um, was run by, I would say, people from Turkey, Turkish family. Um, because I, I like you know, the, the Middle Eastern cuisine that you can get in Europe, and I wanted to have such what's called durum, which is like a, a pita bread with, with meat in it. It seems to me that at various times it might be turkey, it might be, that is the bird turkey, it might be, um, or might be lamb. But it's, it's pretty delicious, the way they serve that up. So I went in there to eat. And it, it was, I think, one of the, the warmest atmospheres I have ever been in in my life. A, a Turkish family that ran it, and they spoke uh, it's Turkish, or I don't know, you know, they could have been, you know, Jordanian. I don't know what, you know, but I, I would, I thought Turkish anyway. And people, but but they clearly had a a clientele clientele that was French, that came in for the two hours or so that I was, that I was there. I, I not reading the menu very well. I ordered in effect two meals for myself, and it took me a while to get through what I could get through. But it, but it gave me an opportunity to sort of study, <coughs> study the clientele and study the atmosphere um, at more length. And it, it, people would come in. They clearly knew these people. And then they, they would speak to the clientele in French, though, certainly better than my French. And it, it was one of the most heartfelt gatherings that, you know, that I've ever um, just experienced in a, you know, in a restaurant or in a pub or a bar or anything like that, the way people knew each other and seemed to enjoy one another. And um, I took it as just, you know, that neighborhood of Kulmar who knew these, who knew the, um, you know, the family that, that kept the restaurant. And in a way, I do think of that as French. <coughs> I mean, not, not inconceivable any place else. I think we have plenty of that in the United States as well, where people of different background come together and just, you know, like each other, and that's you know, the explanation for why they get along so well. But um, you know, French. I mean, the uh, th this this whole idea that you know from France that you know there there can be all of humanity together, and um, you know that that we, we French can embrace other people, and that too went to extreme. We you will see they didn't just embrace them; they taxed them, they forced their sons into the army. <laughs> they quartered their troops there. I mean, that's part of the story of Germany, that in this place where I lived, and everywhere. Part of the story of Italy and Switzerland and Belgium and the Netherlands. They, you know, they were not a, you know, they, it was a conquest by the time Napoleon was, uh, was the emperor of France. So it's not just, it's not a rosy story about the way the French handled <coughs> non-French elsewhere in Europe. But there is somewhere this idea of Humanity belongs together, and I thought I saw some evidence of that in that wonderful evening I spent in Colmar. Anyway, um, how do you suppose the weather is out there? 
Huh? Chilly. I think this is supposed to be the coldest night. Oh. Remember, let your faucets drop. Remember, drip. You remember what happens <laughs> if you don't let your faucets drip? I don't know right? if that's true. That could be a lie. Don't let a frozen pipe. Oh no, it is a lie. That could it's put a. That I could interfere with your yeah. with your February. So anyway, I'll let you go. Anyone with any questions about this whole, you know, barrage of assignments that I've? Okay. Very good. All right, there we go.